Okay, so uh, my name's Jenna, for anyone who hasn't uh, wasn't watching on Thursday. Um, today we're going to go over Pharmacy for Finals Part 2. Um, so hopefully some of you have had a look at the cases that I put on earlier. Don't worry if not, because we're going to go through them all, so it's more than fine if you haven't um, had a chance. Um, make sure you've got access to the online BNF and also a university prescription chart or just a piece of paper so you can have a go with any of the cases that we go through. So on Thursday we went over opioids, renal impairment and fluids. Today we're going to go over um, insulin and anticoagulation. So as I said before, these are the five main things that they can ask you about and pretty much all that they are going to ask you about. So first of all, let's go back to our Kahoot and let's do a little quiz from everything that we learned last time. Okay, I think that's probably everyone. Okay, so first up, the EGFR is an accurate measure of renal function in which of these patients? So is it a 24-week pregnant patient, a 36-year-old male with glomerular arthritis, an 85-year-old frail female, or a 6-year-old boy with DNV? Okay, so we can't use EGFR for anyone that's pregnant, anyone that's at the extremes of age, so that's if they're um, children or elderly and also extreme weight. So where the 85 year old is frail, we wouldn't want to be using it for her, even if she was a 56 year old who was particularly frail. So it's a 36 year old male that we can use the EGFR for. The gonorrhoeophritis was just to kind of throw you off a bit, but it's perfectly fine to use the EGFR for that. Um, in the other patients, we want to use creatinine clearance, which is a much better and more accurate measure. Right, next up. So which type of morphine is oxynorm? Okay, so it's an immediate release. Um, as I said before, it's good to have an idea of the different types of morphine. Kind of just keep a few into your head so you can remember them. Um, don't worry too much about getting the mixed up. Everybody does it and you will have access to the BNF and it will show you exactly what type of morphine it is. Okay, so next, what is the correct prescription for calcium gluconate in hyperkalemia? Great, yeah, so if you remember it's 10, 10, 10, um, an easy, that's just an easy way to remember it. But again, don't worry if you don't remember the dosing, just remember that it's calcium gluconate and that it stabilizes the myocardium. Okay, so what's the starting dose of morphine for an opioid naive patient?
Right, yeah, so it's modified release 10 milligrams BD. Um, five milligrams BD, um, it's just a little bit too too few, so you'd want to give a bit more than that. Um, and then the others are too higher uh, dose frequency, so we wouldn't want to give as much as QDS on a modified release. Okay, last one. What is the average daily requirement of fluid? Yeah, brilliant. So 25 to 30 mils per kilogram per day. Again, all in the BNF under fluids, um, under treatment summary, sorry, and then the fluids and electrolytes. Okay, so let's see who's the winner. Brilliant, well done guys. So today we're going to be talking about insulin. Um, start off and I want you to tell me what are the different effects of insulin. So if you just use the chat function again like we were last time. So yeah, of course, yeah, it lowers the blood sugar. Is there anything in particular more that it does? Great. Protein synthesis. Yeah. Okay, so this is taking us back to our first and second year um, glucose homeostasis and all of that. So it's important to remember that when your blood sugar is high, that's when insulin is naturally normally released. And it basically just uses up all of that glucose and makes sure that it's not just floating around in, in your bloodstream. Um, so it's important to remember the different effects of insulin just because it will help you to realise how important it is that we get the um, dosing right and why it's so important that we still have insulin even when it's depleted. Okay, so a bit more of physiology. So when you have low insulin, your body essentially starts using ketones to keep the brain functioning. This causes um, some acid acidic compounds to be released and it can essentially cause diabetic ketoacidosis, which can cause coma and death. So it's really important that we keep insulin um, established in everybody. So I want you to sort these following insulins into their rapid, short, intermediate and long acting groups. Um, if you just try and do it onto the chat function as well for me so I can see when you've done it. Great. So what about the long acting ones, which to think? Yeah. Great, okay, and then intermediate. Yep, so humulin I is intermediate. Okay, so your rapid acting Nova Rapid, Apedra, and Humalog, your short acting are Act Rapid, Humulin S, intermediate Insulin Tard, and Humulin I, so they're all the ones that have an I in them. Um, long is Levomir and Lantus, they're the L's, and the ultra long is Traceba. Again, with the same with opioids, it's good to have a, a general overview of which is um, rapid, short, and long acting. 
you can essentially just think which are short and rapid together and which are intermediate and long together as long as you've got that two basis and that will work for any of the kind of insulin regimes that we're going to talk about um there's something more important about these two though is because act rapid and human s are both soluble insulins so they're the ones that we want to use when we are treating the uh, high potassium in the last um session and also they're the ones that you'd use for a variable rate infusion now you won't have to use though uh, do any of those in your oscis they won't ask you anything about that but in fifth year they will start talking about these variable rate infusions Okay, so you can also get pre-mixed insulins, which is something to be aware of. So usually they have the word mix or an M in, so it might be Humulin M. Um, just be aware that they are a mix of a rapid and an intermediate insulin. So you don't want to be giving that too much and essentially overloading somebody with insulin. Okay, so our first case. So this is a 19 year old male who's been newly diagnosed with type one diabetes. What is the first line insulin regime recommended by NICE? Great, yeah, general consensus is E, excellent. So nice guidance is that the goal is that you're trying to mimic the natural release of insulin. Um, and the way to do that is to be giving this basal amount that we have throughout everybody throughout the whole day and then bolus amounts with meals as we're getting more carbohydrates. So for our basal one, we want to give a long acting. This is Levamir, which you could give two, twice a day or Lantus, which is just a once a day regime. And then the boluses, you'll be giving something like Nova Rapid, Apuja, or Humalog. So as you can see, this is the normal physiological levels in the gray. And this uh, green line here is just keeping the long acting. So we've got a basal amount throughout the whole day. And then the um, orange peaks are our rapid amounts that we'd be giving um, with meals. So what other insulin regimes are there? Do you know of any other ones? Yeah, twice daily. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so that's pretty much it. So there's a, the basal bolus that like we've been talking about, the continuous subcut pump, which is normally a rapid or a short acting. Um, and that's usually a patient that has type one diabetes, the biphasic or twice daily, and this is where those mixed insulins are used. So you give this twice a day, that can be either in a type one or a type two diabetic. And then there's once daily as well. So that'll be a long acting. This is only usually used in a type 2 diabetic in combination with all therapies such as metformin, sulfonylureas, that kind of thing. So the, the consultants decided in this case that we're going to use a basal bolus. So we're going to use Nova Rapid, six units at breakfast, eight units at lunch and eight units at dinner, and Lantus, 20 units at night. So I want you to write these prescriptions up for me and then give me a little note on the group chat when you're ready.
Right, is everyone ready to go through it? Yeah, okay. So hopefully yours will all look something like this. So for the breakfast time dose, that's different. So we need to use that one separately. So we put Nova Rapid here, the six units at breakfast time. And then for the lunchtime and evening time, they are the same. So we can do those in one dosing like this. And then the Lantus, again, it needs to be on its own. So what are the important parts of insulin prescribing? Yeah, absolutely. So we want to do it by brand name. So this is one of the only things that you do prescribe by brand name. Um, others include lithium, I think, and some um, anti-apoletics, I think you do as well. But insulin is the main one that you guys will be using that you need to prescribe by brand name. So make sure you're putting Nova Rapid, Lantus, Act Rapid, whatever it is, rather than the, just insulin, because it could mean anything. Anything else? Yeah, so both right. So yeah, how you're giving it. So you want to give the device you're using. So like you said here, we've used the No Rapid Flex Pen and the Lantus Solar Star. So it's really important that you save the device because each device is pre-filled, which means that they've got different amounts in. If you're using a different one, you could potentially be giving more or less units than you, you thought you were intending to, um, which obviously could cause hypo or hyperglycemia. Um, and equally, yes, it's really important with units that you write units out in full. Don't just put you because it's so easily mistaken to be a zero and you could be uh, giving someone 10 times the amount that you intended to. Anything else at all that you notice on there? Yeah, exactly. So the concentration or the strength of, of what you're giving. So it's 100 units per mil. Um, and that is the strength of the device that you're giving. So again, even each of these devices come in different strengths. So it's really important that you're really precise with what exactly you mean. There are so many different sorts. So you're literally just making it impossible if you just put Nova Rapid, no one will know. And it's just a, a massive patient safety issue. So it's really important that you're so precise with insulin prescribing. So we've got the brand name, the device, the strength, putting units and not you. And lastly, uh, whole numbers only. So instead of putting 6.5 units or 8.5 units, you need to make sure you only use whole numbers because that's the increments that are, that are on the pre-filled devices. And lastly, not so relevant for you guys, but more for um, when you actually start kind of practicing and become doctors, you never admit your basal insulin. So even when somebody um, isn't, isn't eating or drinking or has diarrhea and vomiting and you want to put them on a variable rate insulin, you'd stop the Nova Rapid, but you would not stop the Lantus. You need to make sure that some, somebody has always got that basal. Um, like what we saw with the physiological insulin, you always have a level of insulin in your body, so you don't want to get rid of that completely. Okay, so our next case. So this is um, Mrs. Mr. Smith's VM chart. So he's a 67 year old male with past medical history of type one diabetes, ischemic heart disease and gout. His current insulin dosing is Nova Rapid 26 units three times a day and Lantus 34 units at night. So this is his chart here. Now, can anyone notice uh, which dose is insufficient and do we think that he needs dose adjustment? Right. So it's the dinner time one that is um, uh, insufficient here. So. We can see that his breakfast, they're all pretty much fine. His lunchtime, they're okay. It's when at dinner that it starts to creep up. So as a general rule of thumb for any hospital drug charts, you want to make sure that the VMs are at least um, are under 15. So anything over 15 is when you need to start thinking about a dose adjustment. Now with the hospital drug charts, these um, the readings are taken after 
uh, before lunch rather sorry so for this for the 10.2 at lunchtime this is um reliant on the breakfast dose does that make sense so you'd have your breakfast have the dose and then your next reading would be before lunch does that make sense so for this one with the dinner time dose we can see that it's high here so it's actually the lunchtime dose that we want to be increasing so that it will affect the reading at dinner okay so it's really important that you look at the trend over a couple of days you can't really look at just one day and and see what's going on there because they may not have been eating as much that day they may have been a bit dehydrated there's so many different reasons so it's really important that you look over a couple of days as i said um you want to aim for a bm of under 15 and your hospital is looking at pre-meal sugars. Also, when you're adjusting doses, you need to make sure it's just adjusting one dose at a time and you only do it by 10 to 20% or essentially one or two units. You don't want to be making massive adjustments and then you wouldn't really know exactly what it is that's gone wrong or gone right. So for our case then, we want to increase the lunchtime dose by one to two units. So he's currently on Nova Rapid 26 units and Lantus 34. So do you want to give a go writing that up? So you can just do the lunchtime one increased. So again, let me know when you're ready. So the bedtime sugars are up, but it's more likely because it's from a backlog effect of already being in quite a bad position. Um, so from the lunchtime dose being too low, the dinnertime dose isn't enough to then kind of pick it all back up again. And it's between lunch and dinner that the problem's occurring. So that's where you want to make the change when you're seeing the incline rather than later on down the line. Does that make sense? Okay. Right, so should we look at what the prescription will look like now? So we want to increase our lunchtime dose. So that's the one that we've changed here to 27 units. So just by one unit, um, and we'll just make, then we recheck all of the BMs for another couple of days and see what difference that's made. Um, we could then look at that point, whether we needed to increase the dinner times one as well, whether the lunchtime one needs to be increased further, um, or if all is okay. So, does anyone know when you might adjust the basal or long acting insulin? Yeah, absolutely. So the way that you know is when the breakfast sugars are um, either low or high, that's when the, the long basal one needs to be changed. So as you know, we give that at night, so it's overnight that that's all been acting and usually people haven't had anything to eat overnight. So the only thing that's affected the morning um, blood sugar is that insulin that you gave the night before. Okay. And again, with that, you would just adjust it by one or two units as well and kind of trial and error, see how it goes. So what may cause changes in insulin requirements? So let's start off with what causes increased requirements of insulin. Yeah, exactly. So if they're eating more. Yeah. Yeah, great. So when you say that unwell, is there anything in particular? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so if you've got DKA, sepsis, steroids, missed doses, pancreatitis or dehydration, they're all reasons for want to increase requirements of insulin. So what about decreased requirements then? What might cause that?
yep, so eating less. Um, yeah, if they're having recurrent hypos, then absolutely, yeah, you'd want to have a look at why that keeps happening. Okay, yeah, so if they reduce calorie intake, reduce renal function or alcohol, so alcohol binges or if they're a chronic alcoholic as well. Um, you're unlikely to be asked this, but it's just something to be aware of. Then in the case history, you can kind of get a feel for what they're going to be asking you based on what's happened. Okay, so the next case. So Mrs. Jones is a 48 year old female with type two diabetes. You're asked to review her blood chart, her BM chart rather, and adjust her insulin if necessary. So which um, dose here do you think may require, uh, which, sorry, which reading do you think is um, deranged here? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it's at lunchtime that it starts increasing and then our dinner time is so high. Bedtime starts to come down a little bit, doesn't it? Is there anything you notice about the medication that she's on? Yeah, so it is a lower morning dose. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's biphasic. So these are mixed insulins. So remember I said that a lot of the insulins with, that are mixed have an M in them. So it's either Novamix or Humulin M, um, that kind of thing. I mean, it's not a general rule, but it's a, a good enough rule of thumb to go for. Um, so these, this is biphasic. So does anyone know what we need to do to adjust a biphasic? Which one would we looking, be looking to adjust in this instance? Yeah, absolutely. So the morning is what is accounting for the whole rest of the day. So you're giving your morning dose after breakfast and it's obviously not enough because the BMs are just going up and up and up until you finally get that dose at, bed, at bedtime as well. So the same thing with these that you just in, you just change them by um, a, a in, an insulin, a unit or two. Um, don't go making massive changes because you just don't know what is going to occur. So again, we'd want to increase this one um, by a couple of units, which would look something like this. And there's no need to add to change the regime or um, add in any other kind of insulins. It's just keep her on the regime that she's on. Okay, case four. So you're called to see Mrs. Brown, who's a 45 year old female. She's, she's presenting new onset confusion and her cap uh, blood glucose is 3.1. She's conscious and her swallow is intact. So I want you to prescribe something to treat this patient and then tell me when you're ready. Okay, everyone ready to carry on? Yeah? Okay, so this is a hypo episode. So the way that we manage these is that we need to assess whether the patient is conscious and whether they have an intact swallow. So if the patient is conscious with an intact swallow, then what we can give them is 20, 10 to 20 grams of glucose orally or 10 to 20 grams of glucose sublingually. So this can either be um, in teaspoons of sugar, sugar lumps, glucosade, Coca-Cola, um, or in glucoboost, glucogel, dextrogel, that kind of thing. 
So you can repeat this after 10 to 15 minutes if they haven't responded. And after the initial treatment that you give, you want to give them a carbohydrate snack as well as a long acting source of insulin. So uh, of sugar rather. So some toast, a sandwich, that kind of thing. Now, if our patients are unconscious, we want to do something completely different. So if they have got um, IV access, we'd be looking at giving IV glucose and that's 250 mils of 10% glucose. If they haven't got an IV cannula, then we want to just give them glucagon. Now that's IM and it's one milligram. You can only give IM, IM glucagon once. If that doesn't work and they don't respond, then you need to put cannula in and give them some IV glucose. Now, you don't need to remember all of this because it is all in the BNF. So if you go to the BNF and go to treatment summaries and hypoglycemia, and you'll find it all on there. So let me show you that. So on treatment summaries, down to hypoglycemia, and beautifully here we've got treatment and it literally tells you exactly what you need to know. It's got different um, amounts of fizzy drinks and that kind of stuff on here, but um, to be honest, it's easier to just go for one of the glucogels because they are actually fully in the BNF. So for this patient then, she's conscious and her swallow's intact. I was very kind to give you like all of that info. Um, so you'd want to prescribe something like the Glucoboost 40% gel. This is again is 10 to 20 and you can give that as required and you can give it as many times as you need to. Now this just goes on the um, PRN side of the prescription. Um, any questions about that? No? Okay, so carrying on. Unfortunately, you've now given two further doses of the glucose boost, but her, her blood glucose is still 3.5. So when you review her, she's now unconscious and she doesn't have a cannula. So what's your next step? Yeah, absolutely. And do you know where you prescribe that and which part of the drug chart? Yeah. Absolutely. So this is an emergency, isn't it? If she is um, unconscious and having a hypo, then we really want to get this into her quickly. So we need to give it stat. If you put it on the PRN side, you don't know when that's going to happen. So it's best to just give it um, on the once only stat side. So you'd write it like this. Make sure you sign it. Um, there's no additional instructions or anything like that. So it's all fine. So any questions about insulin before we move on? That's pretty much all they're going to ask you. It'll either be just prescribing someone's insulin regime, um, adjusting at one dose, or um, prescribing for a hypo. Everyone ready to move on? So you don't need to put the glucogel on stat. Um, you can just give, do that on PRN um, because that's not as urgent because they are still conscious. Um, it's only when they get unconscious that it's a medical emergency that you need to then get it in straight away. Okay. Right, so anticoagulants then. So what are the different types of anticoagulants? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. That's all of them. So unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, vitamin K antagonists or warfarin, and NOAX or DOAX. So what are the clinical uses of anticoagulants? Yeah, so in AF, post-stroke, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, so prophylaxis for VTE um, in AF, in prosthetic valve replacement, and also in PDVT treatment as well. 
Okay, so first of all, um, we'll talk about unfractionated heparins. This isn't really used in practice, so you're quite unlikely to be asked anything about it. Um, it can be used for high risk VTE patients or when there's a high risk of bleeding and it needs quick reversal. So like in vascular surgery, they may give it stat there um, just to kind of stop the bleeding. So does anyone know what needs to be monitored for in heparin therapy? So it's something that can occur from giving being given heparin. Yes, yeah, so your platelets. So have you all heard of HIT? So it's heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So when you've been given um, too much heparin, basically it can cause antibodies against platelets, which causes you to have low platelets and can lead to thrombosis. So it's really important when you do give heparin, and this includes low molecular weight heparin, that you regularly check platelets as well. Okay, and does anyone know what the antidote is for unfractionated heparin? Yeah, absolutely, protamine. So a full reversal can occur with one milligram of protamine. And that is pretty much all they're going to ask you about unfractionated heparin if they ask you anything. Okay, so case five. A 32-year-old female presents to A&E with shortness of breath and pleuritic chest pain for the last two days. So you've got her observations there and her weight and her drug history is on microquinone and naproxen. So what is microquinone? Yeah, so it's a combined oral contraceptive. And what does that make you more at risk of? Yeah, exactly. Gave you a big clue. <laughs> so um, if you could prescribe a safe and appropriate injectable anticoagulant to treat this patient. So I give, again, I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. Okay, ready to go on? Okay, so I think we've all established that she's suffering from a PE, so what we need to prescribe is a low molecular weight heparin. So the different options that you have are noxparin, dolteparin, tinsparin, any other parin you can think of. And all of these doses you will find in the BNF, you don't need to remember them. Um, you just need to put in the drug monograph. So if you just type anoxaparin into the BNF and it'll come up with the dose and everything that you need to know. So in this case then, we're gonna go for anoxaparin. So we need 1.5 milligrams per kilogram, which gives us around 95 milligrams and you need to use to the closest um, syringe increment here because it's injectable so there's no point in putting something that's so like 9.599 because I mean then it's never going to be able to get to that so it's easier to just round up or down it doesn't really matter which way you go about it um, just round up to the closest okay so for um, VTEs uh, for treatment of them rather than what you need to do is provide stat and also regularly so you need to make sure that they're given it this is one of the five kind of medical emergencies that you're going to have in in the whole of, of medicine so you need to make sure that they get it straight away if you just prescribe it on the regular prescription um, it's usually given at 6 p.m so say that the patients come in at 9 a.m if you just put it on regular and kind of forget about it, then they're not going to get that treatment for like a good few hours. So it's really important that you give it straight away. But then also when you prescribe it regularly, you make sure that they're not having more than one lot in a day. 
So if you have already prescribed it stat, you can prescribe it regularly and then just cross off today's dose like it says here. Okay, any questions about that? No? Okay, so what are the important things to consider when you're prescribing heparins? Contraindications, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Yes, if they've got previous GI bleeds, but also if they've got any active GI bleeds as well. Yeah, absolutely, so if they're on any other anticoagulants, yeah. Anything else you want to assess? Something that we covered in um, last week's session? Yeah, their renal function. Great, so the contraindications for use prescribing heparins are if they have haemophilia, any active hemorrhage, any active peptic ulcers, thrombocytopenia, or recent or planned spinal epidural, or if they've got severe renal impairments, that's a creatinine clearance of less than 15. So we want to check their renal function. We also want to check their um, baseline or blood count, get their platelets. We want to confirm and document their body weight, that's for dosing. And we also want to ensure, like someone said, that we're not on any other anticoagulants. Right, so moving on then to our vitamin K antagonists. So your options here are warfarin, phenidione, or I'm not even gonna try and say that one. Um, so most likely what you're gonna see is warfarin. So as we all know, it prevents the synthesis of clotting factors two, seven, nine, ten, and protein C and S. It's really slow onset. So when it's first initiated, it's recommended that you bridge it with low molecular weight heparin for five days. And when the INR is at least over two for two consecutive days. So they can end up actually being on two anticoagulants for a little while, um, but that's only because the warfarin hasn't fully started working yet. So does anyone know what the duration of treatment is for an isolated DVT? Yeah. Okay. So for an isolated DVT, it's six weeks. For a provoked VTE, it's three months. And then for an unprovoked 3TE, it will be over three months. But again, you don't need to remember this because it's all on the BNF. So if you go to treatment summaries and then to our oral anticoagulants, And here it tells you everything about them, what the dose needs to be, the target INR, and then the duration. So everything is on here. So then a 54 year old male has recently undergone aortic metallic valve replacement. So he started on warfarin six days ago and has been bridged with low molecular weight heparin. You need to review his chart and prescribe his next warfarin dose. Okay, everyone ready to move on? Okay. So I don't know how likely you actually are to be asked this because 
I was always told that they'd be really unlikely to get you to prescribe warfarin because it's very difficult. Um, however, in your pharmacy chores, I believe you were taught this or at least shown it. Um, so I thought we may as well cover it just in case. So basically what you need to do is look at the trend over the past couple of days. So he was starting with a big loading dose and that has gradually crept his INR into range. So we were, well, his target INR is about 2.5 and he gradually got there, but then he's now shooted up a bit higher. So we want to prescribe for tomorrow or today rather, but for the next dose. And what you want to do is bring that INR a bit further down. So we want to just decrease. Now, again, similarly with, um, with insulin, it's easy to just do little amounts. So if you just do it in milligrams, so just at least decrease it by one milligram. So put it to three milligrams and then see what effect that has. Uh, warfarin is always given at 6 p.m. It's just one of those, the same with anoxaparin that you need to remember. And that is a national thing that everywhere in the whole country, warfarin will be given at 6 p.m. So it's really important when you start working that you make sure warfarin is prescribed before you clock off at five um, and make sure that over the weekend that it's all prescribed for your patients as well. Okay, so a 63 year old female patient with AF is seen in the GP after her routine INR check. So her INR range is two to three and her INR was 1.2. So she takes five milligrams of warfarin daily. So how do you go about adjusting the warfarin dose? Okay. Okay. So in this patient, she's a stable patient. Um, she's been on the warfarin for a long time and the iron, this is just a momentary INR lapse. So what you do with stable patients is that you adjust their weekly warfarin dose rather than just one looking at one day and increasing just that one day. And you want to increase that dose by five to 20%, quite wide margins, I know, but just go by the BNF. So the weekly dose that she's on is 35 milligrams a week. So if we increase that by 10%, then that's about 38.5. So we can say 39 milligrams a week. We then divide that into daily doses. So it doesn't matter if she's not on the same dose every day. Warfarin tablets come in one milligram, three milligram and five milligram. So it's easy enough to do um, smaller doses that you can just kind of mix and match. And most patients that are on warfarin will be used to kind of um, taking here and there and changing the dose. Um, so we could do something like this. So we on Monday, she may have five, Tuesday, six, Wednesday, five, Tuesday, six, Friday, six, um, Saturday, five, Sunday, six. There's no fine art to it, really. It's all kind of trial and error, which I think is why you'd be very unlikely to be asked something like this, because it is quite difficult and more often a, a consultant decision, um, particularly initiating warfarin, is never done by like an F1 or a fourth year. <laughs> so we don't need to worry about that. Um, so more just as a sake of completeness, I thought I'd cover this, but don't worry about it too much because I know it is a bit confusing. However, what they will probably ask you is some, what counselling points, is it really important to tell somebody when you initiate warfarin? Yeah, yeah, so it's important you tell them about INR checks. Yeah, absolutely. Careful to have, if they have any falls. Yeah, contact sports. Anything else? Yeah, so grape juice. Yeah, great, okay. So for all medications, if you ever get asked what counselling points are there, you can always say that you need to tell them about their indication for why they're being started on the medication and what the medication is, the duration that they're likely to be on it. So for our previous ones, you could tell them, oh, you've had a, an unprovoked DVT, so it's likely you're going to be on it for um, six weeks or 
um, three months or whatever it may be, or lifelong in this kind of case. You also want to tell them the dose. And as I said before, it's really important that um, you tell them morphine comes in different um, size tablets. So you've got one milligram, three milligram and five milligram. And these handily are different colours. So the brown is one milligram, blue is three and pink is five. That's something you'll probably just get used to more than um, having to remember off the top of your head. Um, and it, like everyone said, that you need to tell them about getting their INR checked and how important it is that they go to those appointments and make sure that they, they keep a record of that as well. So you also need to tell them about any medication issues. Warfarin interacts with so many different things. Um, and most of these are the CYP45 um, O inhibitors and inducers. So they increase and decrease the INR. Um, on the handout that I gave last week, um, there's a whole list and mnemonics and stuff to remember those. So just have a look over those and make sure that you know which inhibitors and which are inducers and be able to kind of pick any of those out. Um, it's quite an easy NCQ question. Um, you also have an increased bleeding risk with other antiplatelets, NSAIDs and SSRIs. And then like someone else said, you need to give some lifestyle advice as well. So they need to avoid any vitamin K rich foods. There's things like kale and like leafy green veg um, and cranberry and pomegranate juice. And they also need to avoid alcohol. Basically, if they binge drinking, it can really increase the INR. And if they're a chronic alcohol user, it can really decrease their INR. Now, this is something that I was asked in a formative in my fourth year, I think. Um, and it's a really, really easy question for them to ask you because it's testing whether you know how to use the BNF. You don't need to remember all of this stuff at all. The way you find it, which I didn't know, um, was that you go on treatment summaries or anticoagulants or you go on the warfarin sodium drug monograph and all of that information is on there. So I never knew this before this happened, but in any question they ask you in a pharmacy OSCE, you can look at the BNF. So if they say, oh, like, um, I don't know, what, what effect does Fampicin have on warfarin? You can look it up on the BNF. You don't need to sit there and think, oh, gosh, I can't remember. Just search it. It's absolutely fine to do. And that's what they're kind of testing to see whether you know that that information is available to you. OK, so the same patient now attends A&E with recurrent nosebleeds for two days. So he reports that he's had five episodes of bleeding lasting around five to ten minutes each time. And his INR is 8.6. So I want you to use the BNF to prescribe appropriately for this patient. Okay, so what do you think that we need to do? What's happened to this patient? Yeah, exactly. So he's probably had too much warfarin and we need to stop it. Exactly, and we need to give vitamin K. Now, what do you think happens if you search vitamin K in the BNF? Nothing, it doesn't like it. You need to know the exact name of vitamin K. So, um, or the other way to find it is if you go on treatment summaries and oral anticoagulants, then you find this handy hemorrhage um, proforma, which shows you everything that you need to do. So it looks at whether there's major bleeding and tells you exactly what to do with the INR high or low, um, and whether there's minor or no bleeding. So in this case, his INR was 8.6. So we know that it's over eight. And with just a few nosebleeds, you can say that's quite minor bleeding rather than a major bleed. So what we need to do is stop his warfarin and give vitamin K. Now, I can never, ever remember how to spell this. So I always just used to go about it by looking through BNF and treatment summaries. Um, if you can remember how to spell it, then by all means, just search away and sort of search around, it will come up. But if you just put vitamin K, it doesn't, which is so frustrating. But now you know. So for this guy then, we want to prescribe this stat so that he gets it straight away. So we're giving him two milligrams 
of vitamin K. And you also need to remember it's really important that you cross through the warfarin by just drawing a line through it and then you sign and date it. Right, so moving on to DOAX. So these are things like Dabigatran, Apixaban, Rivaroxaban and Doxaban. So these are licensed for stroke prevention, and treatment or prophylaxis of DVT and P and VTE prophylaxis post hip or knee replacement. So what are the advantages or disadvantages of DOAX? Yeah, absolutely. So there is an antidote for Dabigatran, but it's really expensive. The other ones that isn't an antidote. Yeah, exactly. So you don't need to monitor the INR, which is much better for the patient, isn't it? They don't need to go every week to get their INR monitored. Yeah, so a risk of GI bleeding. Anything else? Yeah. Any contraindications to using DAX? Yeah, exactly, if they're pregnant. Anything else that's contraindication to everything? Yeah, active bleeding. Yes, yeah, so their renal function. So, as you said, the advantage is that they don't need routine monitoring. It's a more regular dosing schedule. So whereas I was saying with warfarin, people are used to being on different amounts every day. Um, with DOAX, it's just one dose um, that they get once or twice a day. And that means that it also can be put into blister packs, which is really important for a lot of these patients who are elderly and therefore can be quite forgetful. You can imagine it's quite hard to remember which dose of warfarin you're needing and where your little yellow book is. So it's easier for this stuff to be able to be in a blister pack and that's be done with. Um, also, they're faster acting, so you don't need to bridge these with um, heparin when you first start them. However, a disadvantage is that there is no monitoring, so you don't really know how they're working. We have to kind of just hope that they're working for the best, and whereas we can kind of keep an eye on warfarin, we can't do the same here. Also, as you said, there's no antidote, so there is one for Dabigatran, but it's really expensive and not used because it's so expensive. The others, there isn't an antidote at all. And also there's multiple contraindications, so such as pregnancy and breastfeeding, like you said, in children, if they've got mechanical mitral valves, antiphospholipid syndrome, or if there's renal impairment. If your creatinine clearance is less than 15, then you can't use Apixaban or Rivaroxaban. And if it's less than 30, you can't use Tabigatran. So, a 29-year-old female is seen in A&E with a Doppler-confirmed DVT, Consultant asked you to prescribe a Pixaban to treat this, that her weight is 58 and her creatinine clearance is 60. So if I want to give that a go and then let me know when you're ready. Okay, everyone ready? So if you look on VNF and just type in a pick span, you'll find that the dose for it. So it's the dose for everybody is 10 milligrams BD for seven days and then five milligrams BD after that. So it's really important when you prescribe it that you put on start dates and stop dates. So for the 10 milligrams, then you'd put on your start date as today and you prescribe for um, evening, uh, morning and evening and then count out seven days and then cross off anyone from that and put your stop date on. 
it's best to do both of those rather than just putting a stop date and hoping someone will notice it. People don't always look. Um, so it's best that if you cross these off, you know that it's definitely not going to be given. And then the same with the five milligrams, it's best to prescribe that now before you kind of forget later on in the line. So you prescribe the five milligrams and put the start date for when you want it to start. But again, cross off the doses before that just to make sure that people aren't getting um, double the amount of Pixar that they should be getting. Okay. Right, so over to Kahoot, we've got another quiz to do. Okay, I think that's everyone. Quarantine. Right, okay, let's start. Okay, so first question. A 20 year old female is newly diagnosed with type one diabetes. Which would be a suitable insulin regime for her? So this was kind of testing one, do you know that it's a um, multiple daily basal bolus that we want to give? And two, do you know the names of the different brands? So Nova Rapid is a rapid acting and Apedra is also rapid acting. So that one's not going to work because we'd be giving two lots of rapid acting. Humulin Eyes Intermediate and Traceba is ultra long. So again, that's not, kind of, it's not the right dosing. Levomir and Lantus are both too long acting, so we don't want to be giving a long acting with meals. So we want to give Humalog, which is a rapid acting, and Levomir, which is um, a long acting. Okay, question two, which insulin should be prescribed for use in an IV insulin infusion? Yeah, great. So Apt Rapid and Humulin S are our soluble insulins. So they're the only ones that you can use in insulin infusions. Again, like I said, you wouldn't be asked to set up a variable rate insulin infusion, but you may be asked to prescribe an insulin infusion for um, high potassium. So you're called to an unconscious patient with a cap blood glucose of two. What is the immediate management? Yeah, absolutely. So you could look at putting a cannula in, but obviously it's quicker if you could just give them some IM glucagon and you can sort them right out. And then if that doesn't work, then you can look at doing a cannula. It's obviously going to be a lot quicker to do that than it is to kind of fiddle about and get your equipment ready. So which of the following is not a contraindication to heparin therapy? Yeah, absolutely. So you can use it in pregnancy, but when you can't use, um, it's DOAX that you can't use in pregnancy.
Okay, so true or false, warfarin requires bridging with low-molecular weight heparin until the INR is over 5. Yeah, absolutely, that's false. So it requires bridging for five days until the INR is over two. It's a little bit of a trick question, but you all knew it. So what's the duration of warfarin therapy for a provoked DVT? Yeah, absolutely. So three months and for an unprovoked, it would be over three months. So which of these is an important counselling point in warfarin therapy? a bit of a trick question all of them are really important counselling points again you don't need to remember it all you can find them all on the BNF okay so at what creatin clearance is a pixaban contraindicated Okay, so it is less than 15 that apixaban and rivaroxaban are contraindicated. It's less than 30 that uh, dibigotran is contraindicated. Okay, so let's see how you did. Very well done. Okay, so over the course of the two sessions, we've gone over um, these five domains. Like I said, this is pretty much all you're going to get asked for prescribing. Um, I'm going to make a little summary sheet of both of the sessions, everything that I think is really important for you guys to know. So um, just like the little kind of mnemonics and little tips I've given you about using your BNF and that kind of thing. Um, I hope that they've been useful. Has anyone got any other questions at all? No worries, guys. Oh, thank you. So I hope, um, hope that you've enjoyed it and I hope it has been useful. Feel free to message me on Facebook or email Peer Medics if um, you have any other questions or if you've got any suggestions for any other teaching that you'd like. We're all around, I'm currently isolating, so I've got lots of time on my hands. Um, so feel free to message me. If you wouldn't mind filling in the feedback, then that'd be really handy just so we can keep the sessions um, good and make sure that they are relevant and what you guys want. Okay, thank you very much, guys.